Hello everyone and welcome to our second video tutorial on NuSynths. Today we're going to be looking at public NuSynths. Just a reminder that there are two types of NuSynths. There's private NuSynths, which is seeking to protect private rights to enjoyment of land. So that's where there's a NuSynths typically affecting neighbours. Whereas there's also public NuSynths, which is unusual because it's a crime and a tort. And this is where there's a nuisance affecting a class of Her Majesty's subjects or affecting the public as a whole. And this is the type of nuisance that we're going to be looking at today. Public nuisance is a nuisance which affects the public generally. And it was defined in PYA quarries by Roma Lord Justice. And he said that a public nuisance, quote, materially affects the reasonable comfort and convenience of life of a class of Her Majesty's subjects. So this is what's key here, a class of Her Majesty's subjects. So this is more than just a dispute between two neighbours. This is where there's a group of people, a class of people being affected by the nuisance. It's worth at this point just considering the historical development of public nuisance. Traditionally, public nuisance was used to deal with obstructing the public highway. But nowadays, that's covered under Section 137 of the Highways Act 1980. Um, and a lot of the things that used to be covered by public nuisance are now actually covered by Acts of Parliament instead. And in the case of Rimington, the House of Lords said that public nuisance shouldn't be used for conduct which is now covered by statute unless there's good reason. So public nuisance is perhaps not as useful as it used to be because we've got Acts of Parliament now that cover all the problems it used to deal with. Nowadays, public nuisance um, is mainly used for misbehaviour in public. So big parties, um, hanging off bridges, that sort of thing. But we'll see some of that when we look at the cases. There are two requirements for proving that there's a public nuisance. Firstly, the risk of the nuisance must be reasonably foreseeable. And secondly, as we've already mentioned, there must be a class of people affected. So we'll start off by looking at reasonably foreseeable. We have two cases here which look at foreseeability of the risk of the type of nuisance. And our first one is Cambridge Water. And this was a really big, important House of Lords case. And what happened here was that the defendant owned a leather tanning business and spillages of small amounts of solvents occurred over a long period of time. And these solvents were seeping through the floor of the building into the soil below. And the solvents eventually made their way into the borehole, which was owned by the Cambridge Water Company. And the borehole was used for supplying water to local residents. And unfortunately, the water became contaminated and had to be closed. Um, and Cambridge Water um, was suing in a number of torts, negligence, nuisance and rylands. But for now, we're looking, obviously, at the nuisance issue. And here you can see that the court decided that there was no public nuisance here because they didn't think it was reasonably foreseeable that tiny spillages of solvents would eventually result um, in a water borehole being closed down. The other case we've got here um, is Goldstein. And in this case, um, Goldstein sent some salt and a check in repayment of a, de of a debt to a friend. Um, and he sent it by post. And he put salt in the envelope as a joke um, but unfortunately, some of the salt leaked out of the envelope in a post office and a postal worker mistook it for anthrax and the post office was shut down. Now, here again, the House of Lords had to consider whether there was a public nuisance here because lots of people were affected, obviously, in the post office. Um, the House of Lords said there was no public nuisance because it wasn't reasonably foreseeable to the defendant that salt would escape and cause the nuisance. And they actually made the point in this case that um, Goldstein's reason for putting salt in the envelope was that he wanted to have a little joke with his friend. And if he thought for a second that salt was going to escape, that would have ruined his joke. So it clearly wasn't a foreseeable thing that was going to happen. Um, 
So it has to be foreseeable that this nuisance is going to occur. That's your first requirement. Our second requirement is that there has to be a class of people affected. Now, unfortunately, the law on public nuisance is very unclear here. Um, we've got two cases with two different judges. So we've got Roma here and the wonderful Denning below him. And I've given you some quotes from these judges because I actually think they're quite funny. These are examples of the judges waffling round and not giving a clear answer. So in both of these quotes, the judges are explaining or failing to explain how many people's in a class. So if you look at Roma LJ, he says the sphere of the nuisance may be described generally as, quote, the neighbourhood. But the question whether the local community within that sphere comprises a sufficient number of persons to constitute a class of the public is a question of fact in every case. So that's a way of saying it depends. It's not necessary in my judgment to prove that every member of the class has been affected. It's sufficient to show a representative cross section of the class has been affected. So he's saying it's a question of fact in every case. If we look at Denning then, how's he defined a class of people? He actually says, I decline to answer the question how many people are necessary to make up Her Majesty's subjects generally. So he's actually saying, I refuse to answer how many people are in a class. He says that he prefers to look at the reason of the thing and to say that a public nuisance is a nuisance which is so widespread in its range or so indiscriminate in its effect that it would not be reasonable to expect one person to take proceedings on his own, but it should be taken on the responsibility of the community at large. So he's not answering, but he's saying that it's widespread in its range. It's indiscriminate in its effect. Why are the judges being so vague? Well, there is a practical reason for this, of course, because if they give a number that there has to be, say, 10 people in a class, or four people in a class, that's potentially limiting claims that an occur, can occur in the future, sorry. So judges don't want to do that. So they're deliberately being vague so that a class of people can be interpreted on a case by case basis by the judges. If we turn then to some case law, this might help us to see what has been held to be a class of people. So in Ruffle, quite an amusing case here. We've got a defendant had an acid house party. Um, lots of traffic were blocking the road. There was loud music all night. But what was really strange about this case is that the woodlands around this house had been littered with human excrement. And that caused most displeasure to local residents who were walking their dogs to actually see human doings in the wood. Um, so there was a public nuisance here, um, held to be a nuisance, there was a class of people and the class of people was held to be the local residents. So people in the local area were clearly affected by the acid house party. In the case of Ong here, we had um, a defendant and some friends were planning to switch off the floodlights in a football match. And there's held to be a public nuisance where a class of people, in this case, it would be all the football spectators who were there. They would clearly be a class of people who are going to be affected by switching off the floodlights. In Lowry, we had a defendant making hoax calls to emergency services, and that was held to be a public nuisance. And the class of people here were people who couldn't get through to emergency services when they wanted to because of all the hoax calls. So that was your class of people there. So what was interesting in this case was they were saying, we don't have to identify specifically who the people are, you know, Betty, John and David or whatever. We don't have to do that. We can just be vaguer and say the class is anybody who was trying to call and couldn't. We've then got Rimmington, and this is a really important House of Lords decision, which has actually given us two ratios, which you can see here. So in Rimmington, the defendant was sending racially abusive sorry, letters to members of the public. 
And that was held not to be a public nuisance because what the court said was sending individual letters to individual people was not affecting a class of people. It was affecting individuals. The House of Lords also made the point that public nuisance shouldn't be used if the situation is now covered by an act of parliament. So in Rimington, he could have been prosecuted under the Malicious Communications Act. So although they were saying it wasn't a public nuisance here, he could have been guilty of an offence under this act of parliament. So it doesn't mean he's getting away with this unpleasant thing scot-free. He's just not guilty of a public nuisance. He would be guilty under this act. And then we've got quite an interesting case here. It's quite a recent one, Roberts and Others from 2018. This case involved fracking. Um, it's quite interesting to me because um, quite local and it was involving fracking for oil and gas between Blackpool and Preston. And the appellants in this case had caused disruption by protesting. What they were doing was climbing on lorries, causing disruption to traffic because they were concerned about the environment. They were being prosecuted for a public nuisance um, and they were convicted and they were actually sentenced to imprisonment. They appealed against their sentence and the Court of Appeal actually said that the prison sentences were, quote, manifestly excessive. And the Court of Appeal quashed those and they were replaced instead with conditional discharges, which means that they didn't have to remain in prison. But this was really interesting because um, what the appellants were saying here was that a custodial sentence shouldn't be given for a non-violent crime and that this violated their rights under the European Convention on Human Rights, i.e. their right to a peaceful protest. Um, and I think they made a really valid point there. Um, but it shows some inconsistencies with the law on public nuisance and the way it's dealt with. Um, and if the courts can't agree on the correct sentence to be given, that's clearly a concern. And the fact that this is such a recent case shows that the law on public nuisance arguably isn't satisfactory in its current state. So I said at the beginning that public nuisance is a crime and a tort, and it is. Um, so obviously, if, if someone's being prosecuted under the criminal law for a public nuisance, then the prosecution's going to deal with that, and that's a criminal issue. Because we're studying tort at the moment, we're looking at how you bring an action in a civil case. So if you want to bring a civil action for public nuisance, it can happen in three ways. Firstly, there's what we call a realtor action. Um, and this is where the attorney general will bring the case on behalf of a private citizen. But you can see such actions are very rare. A local authority could bring the action under the Local Government Act. So if, for example, there was an acid house party um, on Crompton Lane, it might be that Holton Council want to bring the action because they're concerned about this public nuisance. The other way is by an action um, for tort by a private citizen. But if you want to bring your public nuisance claim as a private citizen, you have to show that you've suffered some special damage above and beyond what everyone else in the class did. Um, so you have to show, OK, the noise disrupted everyone in the local area, but I suffered more because X, Y and Z. So they're the three ways you can bring the action. So I'd just like to finish this tutorial by looking at the summary slide here. Um, so just to recap then, a public nuisance is a crime and a tort, and it's affecting a representative cross-section of a class um, in a neighbourhood. You have to prove foreseeability, and you have to prove that a class of people has been affected and we've just looked at um, the three ways that you can bring a civil claim. I would urge you to have a look at the Law Commission report from 2015 on this to look at how heavily criticised public nuisance has been in recent years.